Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Thanks very much for joining us today. And I'd like to wish all of our ISO Show listeners a very happy new year. I hope you enjoyed listening to the podcasts uh, in 2021. We've got lots to look forward to in 2022. And today's episode is actually going to be kicking off with a podcast all about energy management and auditing. So we have previously covered an introduction to ISO 50001 and uh, steps to implementing the standard. So I've invited Paul Robinson back, who's a managing consultant here at Blackmores, to basically provide guidance and advice on how to implement the energy management standard ISO 50001. Now, for those of you that aren't certified ISO 50001, it's not a problem. You can still audit against energy management, even if you don't have that standard or even a system in place. But there are lots of things that you can do to check that you are optimizing the use of your energy, uh, reducing it where possible, and to be able to make sure that the controls and systems that you do have in place, even if they're not formally documented or communicated, are actually working for you in practice. Now, obviously, it could also flush out some opportunities for improvement if you're not doing some of these things. So either way, whether you're certified to 50,001 or not, this will be a great podcast for you to listen to, to, to look at how you can make improvements in your energy management, because the first thing that you need to do is obviously understand exactly where you're at. And uh, obviously a great place to start is looking at, at benchmarking against this standard ISO 50001. So let's kick off with uh, bringing Paul in. Hi, Paul. Hi, Mel. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Happy New Year to you. And to you. Great. So um, let's look at, you know, obviously we've talked about 50001, but what's the purpose of carrying out internal audits? Well, it's a requirement of the standard and regardless of whether you've got your management system certified or not, that there's certainly some good benefit to undertaking audits uh, against the 50,001 standard. But really fundamentally what we're looking to do is, is make sure that the management system is effectively implemented and maintained. Firstly, that you're following the requirements of the standard, but if you haven't implemented the standard, we can also get some really great benefits out of uh, conducting audits as well. You know, what we're trying to do when we conduct audits of the management system is, is tease out those opportunities for improvement. So hopefully with an effective audit program and if you're auditing the operational controls of the management system, you should get some, some benefits in terms of opportunities for improvement, for improved energy use, hopefully uh, leading to cost savings. Great. I mean, could you give us an example of where you've you've carried out some energy audits for an organisation and you've identified opportunities and what kind of difference that, that's made to the company? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the main one probably is, is going to be auditing data centres. Data centres use an, an enormous amount of energy to um, not only keep their own infrastructure going, but also to, to operate their, either their clients or their own IT infrastructure. And where we've seen lots of benefit from conducting audits is, is where we've teased out improvements and identified areas of opportunity um, in regards to calling plant and equipment. So making sure that, say, for example, calling plant is um, well insulated and the calling water that's fed through to the, the calling systems is, uh, is used in the most optimal way possible so that uh, ultimately it's, it's calling that IT equipment. Obviously, the big benefit of that is, is you're using it as, as effectively as possible, but also you're not getting losses as well. So the efficiencies within in the data centers are maintained and, and optimized. So before you actually start auditing, you need to develop some type of program or plan. Could you just explain what an organization would need to do in order to be able to collate that program of internal audits? Sure, yeah. So within any organization, there's, there's a number of functions and processes involved in, in managing energy. A lot of that will be generally owned by, say, the FM team or engineering team within the organization. But around that, as well as a number of support functions. So whenever we conduct an audit, we're looking to audit processes 
and if we can pull together a, an audit program which is first of all risk focused so we look at the areas where the, the risk is, is greatest and where energy is being used the most we can also focus in on the results of previous audits as well so if there's been a, a particularly poor audit in an area uh, in the past again we, we can look to audit that possibly more frequently so that, that's an example of taking a risk-based approach but fundamentally what we're, what we're trying to do is audit all of the functions within the organization and then we can tie that back to then the requirements of the standard so that we, we audit both the, the requirements of the standard but also the, the key functions within the business so if we can pull together a program around that set out the frequency of audits set out the people who are going to be audited the auditees uh, and the process owners and then select auditors who are independent of those functions and impartial that should set up a nice robust audit program going forward okay great actually this is a good opportunity for me to plug our iso support plan service so i'm going to shamelessly do that now so about 70 percent of the work that we do at blackmores which is the organization behind this podcast and also behind the isology hub our online membership so we provide support to hundreds of organisations to help them to put together a programme of internal audits and actually carry out those internal audits. And we have, as Paul's mentioned, he's, he's actually audited data centres across Europe against this standard. But yeah, that's, that's a service where we can take care of all of your auditing needs to support compliance to ISL standards, but also gives you kind of peace of mind and that reassurance that, that yes, your, your energy management systems are working effectively. So that's the end of that plug. <laughs> uh, so moving on then, Paul, so you mentioned about within your programme, you're looking at the functions and, and how they're aligned with the standard. But this standard is quite different in that when you're auditing, you're looking at the, the physical aspects as well, aren't you? So you're looking at things like the building, the building fabric and heating and things like that. Could you just kind of explain that in a bit more detail, please? Because I, I know I've only kind of skimmed the surface on that. Could you go into that in a bit more detail? Yeah, sure. I mean, any good energy audit should consider the, the fabric of the building and things like air tightness. Lots of buildings, and again, depending on the function of the building, have lots of rather large holes in them door entries, roller shutter doors, vents, these sort of things which lets heat out but also in some cases keep cold in so depending on the function of the building if it's an office or an industrial facility or a refrigeration unit even you're trying to, you're trying to ask that building to do different things so certainly insulation within that building is really important and you know things like door apertures again can be massive heat losses uh, or equally let, let heat into buildings uh, when it's not wanted. So when we're auditing, we're looking for opportunities for improvement. First of all, making sure that you know if there are operational controls around those, say for example, doors or windows or anything like that, that they're uh, enacted, but also looking for areas of opportunity to improve and maintain that, that air tightness. So if, you know things like with roller shutter doors, you, know, you could put in supplementary fast shut doors if walk trucks are moving in and out of, of areas or if even simple door controls where when the forklift passes the door automatically opens it and closes behind the fork truck so all of those sort of things you know can, can be teased out of a, an energy audit and add value for, for the client in ensuring that they're not having to generate additional heat or additional chilling in some cases to, to maintain the temperatures within the building beyond that the obvious things you know we were looking for sort of holes in roofs or and those sort of situations where you know sometimes again they're, they're letting heat out things like destratification fans i mean the amount of times i've walked around a building and you see these destratification fans in in the roof their purpose really is to push heat back down into the the building so we're not having to constantly generate heat to heat a space sometimes they'll be switched off you know and so, something as simple as switching them back on again can save a lot of energy so yeah, that, that's typically where we're looking in regards to building and building fabric. On that then, it's worthwhile, you know, even if an organisation isn't certified to 50,001, is going around and, and checking these things because ultimately that's what you're doing as part of an internal audit is checking that the systems that you should have in place are actually working and that people are aware of how to operate them as well. Uh, so it could be a simple case of certain people not being aware that they're responsible for turning these things on and off and again that can just help to improve communication clarification 
uh, roles and responsibilities as well so that these ha things happen day in day out you don't have to wait you know six months for somebody to do an audit to tell you that that something hasn't been turned on or off <laughs> for six months yeah yeah absolutely and, and wherever possible you know it, it's a case of automating those controls as well so you're not you're taking that human factor out of it and there's so many now you know electronic heating controls timers these sort of things that you can use for aircon systems you know heaters chillers coolers you know etc that can take the human piece out of it so that you don't end up with these what i sort of liken to as an example air conditioning wars where, where you've got one end of the office wanting it really hot the other end of the office wanting it really cold and they're playing with the timers all, all day long trying to get the right temperature when if you take the human element out and and let the the controls do the work then uh, the whole system can be optimised and uh, and used more efficiently. Yeah, and you know, building management systems are great for that, aren't they? Which a lot of our clients have. But again, it's, it's making sure that you've got controls in place to be able to monitor and measure the performance of them, that they are being used correctly. All of the the different kit that you've got within an organisation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and even building management systems, you know, that they need to be maintained and checked, and in some cases calibrated to ensure that they are set correctly you know switching on and off correctly at the right times the correct alarms are coming on when when they're needed so yeah there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining these systems and again those reports those service records can be used as evidence during an audit of an energy management system so in terms of the service records then i mean because more often than not like an air conditioning unit would be maintained by an external supplier so how important is it that you have got good relations with them and that you've got all the necessary records and what, what kind of records would you need in, in those kind of situations? It's really important. I mean, a lot of this work generally is undertaken by, by third parties, contractors who you know, the organisation is employing to maintain that equipment. So with, with air conditioning systems, for example, you know, we would be looking to ensure that the, the engineers are firstly competent to undertake the work with regards to handling refrigerant gases but we'd also be looking for the for the company certificate as well typically to handle refrigerant gases beyond that then we're looking for a, a service schedule you know some sort of uh, annual maintenance plan and then supporting that in terms of the evidence of the actual maintenance taking place we'd be looking for the service records as well maintained either in hard copy or, or electronic form I think the other, the other key thing to stress as well in regards to the people who are undertaking work on your systems is making them aware of the fact that you have an energy management system and you are looking at energy efficiency. Make them aware of you, your energy policy and invite them to actually bring forward ideas and suggestions for improvement as well because that can all feed into driving continued improvement. Absolutely, yeah. So are there any other things that we should be looking out for when we're carrying out our energy audits? Um, you're generally looking for evidence of good practice. Again, in, in other pieces of equipment, I mean, for example, um, if we're looking at, say, for example, boilers, again, touching on the, the contractor's piece, you know, they're generally maintained by contractors. Again, that's a highly skilled job. Uh, those contractors need to be competent. And again, we're looking for things like combustion test results. Normally, we'll find them sort of sellotaped to the side of the boiler or held in a, a, a set of records somewhere. So that's really important to ensure that the boilers are firing correctly and, and are being, again, used efficiently as possible. Again, service records for those, absolutely critical, and, and they should be looked at you know, at least once a year. Air conditioning, we've, we've already touched on air conditioning, but at the larger level, you've got things like chiller units. And again, we're looking for things like timers, controllers, timers looking to try and you know, minimize heat gains in those systems. And um, we're looking to make sure that you know, heat exchangers aren't being fouled and things like that. So that again, they're being used as efficiently as possible. With regards to you know, lighting, again, we can be looking at trying to look at lamp replacement programs. So again, you know, there's opportunities to walk around as an energy auditor. And if there's old lamps in buildings, uh, particularly warehouses, which are very energy hungry buildings, you normally see the old sort of 400 halogen, you know, the sort of orange glow coming from some of the lamps there they can now absolutely be replaced and should be, re be replaced with uh, LEDs. And you know, that, that's an absolute easy win in terms of a payback on those, but also illumination levels, lighting controls. You know, very often now with LED lights, you can get the lights to switch on or off or dim down to sort of 10% levels when 
the rooms aren't occupied or you know, you've got sort of minimal occupation levels in there so all of these sort of considerations can be again factored in and, and highlighted in, a, in an energy audit. So just on that then, Paul, so let's say an organisation, they don't have these controls in place. Could you possibly raise it as an opportunity for improvement within that report that they could take those sorts of things into consideration? Yeah, absolutely. Because what can happen there is that those opportunities for improvement can be fed into the management system and assessed. If some of these things might not pay back, you know, it might be a, a very long payback or they might not be economically viable to implement with the resources that the organisation's got to hand at that time, but they could be sort of considered for, for future implementation or, you know, when, when the plant comes to the end of life um, and that asset's served its purpose, you know, again, that, that could be a consideration for future replacements rather than replacing like for like. It could be that, you know, a, a more innovative solution could be found. Yeah, so I think... Obviously, we have covered auditing as in previous episodes when we look at the steps of success in implementing an ISO standard. And we've always said that audit shouldn't be seen as a tick box exercise, that it's a fail or a pass. It is actually a lot about looking at what's working well, where the opportunities for improvement are. So this, in effect, could be a good putting forward a good business case, you know, to the leadership team that actually if you if you do look into either investing in LED lights or are we even just putting in place an, a lamp replacement policy so that when a lamp goes people know to replace it with a more energy efficient type product. So some of those things are not necessarily costly to, to a business but it, it's a case of putting in place communications and controls so people are aware that they can actually make a difference and, and they can all come out of those OFIs can't they the opportunities for improvements. Absolutely yeah and you know, any audit should be a, a conversation. So beyond that, actually, it's not only a conversation, but also then following evidence trails. So if you can have a conversation with the people who are in those areas, and generally they're, they're experts in their, in their fields. They know what's going right in that area. They know equally what's going wrong. And if, again, if you can tease out of, of them during those conversations, when you are conducting those audits, they can help drive improvement and ultimately help them to resolve some of the issues that they have in their their particular areas so that process-based approach you know having those conversations asking them where they feel the improvements could be made um, can all help and support you know the evidence in the audit report and i mean there are obviously there are other areas as well so if the company's got a kitchen then there might be appliances there i was just going to ask you based on your experience of auditing iso 50,001 and different types of organizations where do you see generally where the biggest opportunity for improvement is? Mm, it varies. Um, and again, it depends on, on the type of organisation. Typically in, in industrial type organisations, you can be looking at heating areas. You know, generally, manufacturing has been done in, in very large sheds. They're big empty spaces, you know, and again, they're, they're very expensive to heat if you've got people in there. But again, you as I touched on earlier, you've got doors opening and shutting. You've got large pieces of equipment, uh, motor driven equipment generally operating in those areas. Generally as well you've also got um, compressed air being generated so you've got compressors whirring away in the background. If, if you've got air leaks in those areas and, and you're using compressed air inefficiently that can be a major energy sink you know in, in terms of compressors having to work harder to maintain air pressure uh, within business and it's often not until you walk around sort of after hours when all the machines have, have stopped working and all the noise has died down where you can hear the, the hissing of the, the air hoses going away in the background where you can hear the, the leaks. So that's often a, a, you know, a great area to focus in on. In other situations, you know, I've audited hospital type environments and again, a lot of the focus there is on generating heat for uh, not only space heating, Obviously, you know, they've got patients in there 24-7, so they have to maintain the, the temperature on the wards. There's a massive amount of gas being consumed in boilers, heating hot water to keep the heating on, you know, and, and obviously that's, that's critical. So um, in hospital situations, you know, we've highlighted, uh, focused in on the significant energy uses there and focused in on where we can make improvements there, which ultimately then you know, reduces the kilowatt requirements and, and saves money for the, for the NHS trusts. Um, in data centres, it's very much about cooling and, and keeping IT equipment cool. So again, the focus there is on significant energy uses 
and you're focusing on chillers and the plant for chilling water, moving water around the data centre, through to computer room, air conditioning units and uh, and how that's distributed through the data centre. So uh, it varies is, is, <laughs> is the answer to your question, but it, it, it very much depends. No, it's depends. a very broad question. <laughs> you gave a, a cracking response though, Paul. Thank you for that. Yeah, but ultimately it drives us back to our energy reviews and what we determine in the energy reviews is as what's being significant in terms of energy uses. So that immediately you know, gives us a focus area to go in and audit against because that's where we know the, the largest, greatest amount of energy is, is being consumed. So I think in terms of wrapping up then, when it comes to writing up the report, obviously you need to be able to evidence certain records what you've observed that is compliant you have touched on some of those uh, actually when you mentioned about certain maintenance records and uh, certain supplier records as well but i'm sure there are a few more uh, <laughs> out there would you mind just sharing with our iSocial listeners a few more examples of evidence that you might expect to see when you're carrying out an iso 50001 energy audit yeah, so as you rightly said, I mean, generally when I'm auditing, you know, the starting point is a maintenance schedule. From there, then you're looking at the equipment maintenance records, service records. It could be specification records for that equipment, you know, the design records and then how, how systems are, are put together, you know, and designed. Certainly evidence of competency for the engineers that are doing the work on those systems. We want to make sure that they are, are competent to, to undertake that work. But also within the, within the organisation itself, induction and training records as well, making sure people are, are aware of the requirements. But also it, it could take you off into looking at um, procurement and um, procurement records, making sure that energy is, is considered in procurement records and, and that works through into proposals, quotations, justifications for spend and also through into, into purchase orders as well. Any external auditor will look at internal audit records. So that they're making sure that uh, the internal audit program has been established and has been implemented effectively. There's also requirements to look at legal compliance and there may be sort of evidence of, of legal compliance that we may need to show. So in the, in the UK, for example, that might be a submission uh, to the Environment Agency for the, the four yearly ESOS assessments. Monitoring and measuring, absolutely critical. You know, any assessment should look at monitoring and measuring because what we're looking for there is is trying to identify those spikes and you know unusual patterns in in energy use where again a, a deviation from expected use might have been detected or certainly should be detected supporting that as well calibration certificates for for equipment where you know meters need to be calibrated for example Corrective preventive action records, uh, again, when things go wrong, we, we want to make sure that they have been actually and effectively addressed and fixed. And finally, then management review records as well, because again, a management review is a, is a really key step in the process of it, not only establishing, but also maintaining an energy management system. You know, ultimately management review, we want to make sure that the management system is, is effective and, and is driving that improvement in energy use. So those, those management review records should hopefully confirm that or provide actions where, where that's not being achieved. So in a nutshell, that's, that's pretty much the sort of typical evidence trails that in terms of records that we'd be looking for as, as auditors. Brilliant, that's great. Thanks very much for sharing all of that great knowledge and information experience with us, Paul, about auditing energy management standards, including obviously ISO 50001. But I know this does cut across CNO you know, supporting other standards obviously ISO 14064 which we've covered on the podcast uh, last year on carbon footprint verification being able to understand what your energy consumption is obviously is, is really key and this can dovetail into 50001 as a standard so yeah our ISO show listeners haven't listened to that podcast the two podcasts were actually our most popular podcasts in 2021 so don't forget to check those out so that was ISO 14064 which is carbon footprint verification PAS 2060 which is carbon neutrality and the third one after that was on carbonology, which is our methodology for combining the two standards to help you to verify your carbon footprint and be carbon neutral. So if that's something that's an objective for you over the next year or so, then yeah, please do check those out. So 
Yeah, thanks very much for joining us today, Paul. Pleasure. Great. Thanks very much. So just a, a, another bit of information that could be useful for you. If you're listening to this and thinking, yeah, actually, we would like to find out a bit more about ISO 50001. Over in the ISOlogy Hub, our membership portal, you can get access to an ISO 50001 e-learning course. That's all included uh, within the package. And we've also got various other checklists, downloads, uh, such as a, an internal audit program that's in there. Standards Handbook on how to maintain ISO 50001 once you're certified to that. But if you wanted a, some type of guide on, on how to implement ISO 50001 and would like to do your own self-assessment kind of checklist, we have got our ISO standards blueprint, which is actually applicable to all ISO standards. And that basically lets you assess where you're at in terms of planning, creating, launching, implementing uh, your management system in order to get certified. So links to that are in the show notes. So for me, that's all for today. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And uh, yeah, we look forward to catching you on the next ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoorsuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.